Um, it is September the 16th, 2021, and you're watching and listening to Curiously Polar. Hello, welcome back. I'm Chris. This is Henry. No, this way. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just the two of us today, and we are pre-recording this, as you might have heard uh, by the discrepancy of the date I just said and uh, what is on your calendar right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's see. We're we... missing Mario today. Yeah, Mario's uh, he's busy. He's doing important things. <laughs> so um, we are doing the unimportant thing to record another episode of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, Henry, you've brought us interesting stuff. Um, we want to talk about space again today. Um, it's a recurring topic. It is a recurring topic, and it, <laughs> it's it's closely linked to what's going on down here. Um, and uh, before that, we are going to open our polar newsreel first. So, what have you brought us? The first topic um, links a little bit or connects to what we um, talked in the last episode. We talked a lot about um, ecosystems and uh, particularly krill and the research paper I brought in, or the article, um, actually talks about the um, increased um, research on krill to actually really um, figure out how important it is for the entire ecosystem in Antarctica. And uh, if you go to the article, you can, can find some incredible numbers for um, how much krill there is outside. And we, we talk about that the entire world's population of krill with a majority being in antarctic waters weighs um between 300 and 500 million tons Whoa. so just the the livestock of krill is almost outweighing uh human um life on the planet in in uh, terms of weight and you have nice little uh graphics like the picture we we see right now on the screen um that illustrate a little bit the importance say uh krill being um, the beginning of the food chain for so many different life forms in the Southern Ocean. It has been um, hunted or fished very, very heavily. And in, in, in fact, a number of nations actually seek to increase the uh, quotas to catch in the Southern Ocean. And now scientists are using the chance to trying to track the impacts of fishing uh, and climate change on this very, very vital part of the uh, Antarctic food chain. What I thought do uh, we? What do we use krill for? I don't remember seeing krill on the menu at a restaurant anywhere. No, krill is um, largely used for omega three um, supplement products ah. um, to, to have fish oil products. Um, it has been used in the beginning, and that was the beginning of krill fishing um, by uh, Soviet. Uh, fisheries as a food supplement they mm -hmm. actually turned that into a paste and that paste was surprisingly um yummy for <laughs> a lot of people so that was um kind of the beginning um and it was unregulated so in, in the first season they came back with tons of uh, of krill and next year they sent back more and that has changed um, a lot through the establishment of um, the antarctic treaty system and through marine protective areas, but that's also part of the negotiations for um, the next marine protected area, uh, which is at debate at the moment, um, which is supposed to protect the Weddell Sea and um, adjacent waters. There are a number of nations who try to uh, oppose that for a number of reasons, but one certainly is also that the Weddell Sea is kind of a very important um, upwelling spot for krill and uh, hands very important for fisheries in the th uh, South Ocean. Hmm. Well, next up, South next Georgia. Next up, South Georgia. Yeah, one of my most favorite uh, places on this planet. It's really, really great. And a few days back, um, South Georgia has actually uh, launched a new research and monitoring plan for the island uh, or group of islands, the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands Marine Protected Area. That's a large area. It contains not only the island of South Georgia, but also the belt of smaller islands, the South Sandwich Islands. But it largely focuses on research on South Georgia. The Marine Protected Area um, shall protect the very, very productive waters around South Georgia. We have um, the island here 
pretty much directly on the um, uh, circumpolar current, on the uh, polar front, if you like. So where we have the upwelling of the uh, nu um, nutrient-rich uh, Antarctic waters and the South um, Atlantic waters. And that brings a huge ecosystem there and the marine protected area is supposed to protect that. And this new research and management plan is um, providing guidance for um, scientific activities and those activities, they are supposed to um, contribute to um, a better understanding of the entire marine ecosystem around the group of islands. It's supposed to assess the nature. Um, uh, it's uh, supposed to assess um, certain threats that are coming up to biodiversity um, in, in the future through climate change, warming ocean, changing acid, uh, acidities in the um, uh, ocean. It's supposed to provide information to evaluate the effectiveness of the marine protected area that is in place. So how well does it actually work? And it shall inform the development of enhanced um, responsive management as it is required to actually work on a marine protected area of that size. So it's a, a very um, interesting part um, from a scientific uh, point of view. Not much will change for um, tourists visiting South Georgia, but the outcome is supposed to be very, very uh, important for the development of the area. And that's, um, yeah, just launched on September 15th. So yesterday when we record that, uh, a few days back when we air the episode. So that was a, a big announcement. All right, from, uh, from the islands, let's go underwater. Next item on the list uh, is about drones. Yeah, we talked about that also briefly in the in the past episodes. Underwater drones become more and more uh, important to um, get a better understanding of the uh, sea, of the entire ocean, of the of the water column, if you like. Um, and Chinese scientists have recently published uh, a very fascinating review on the use of those so uh, so called unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, particularly in polar research, which is very um, much our focus topic here, and an area. Um, which China um, excels now is in um, providing these uh, underwater drones. And uh, if you look at the Chinese research history, China has, since the 1980s, conducted numerous uh, expedition in number. It's almost uh, 40 Antarctic expedition and uh, more than 10 um, Arctic expeditions. And the, in that paper, they actually review a, a, a big number of um, types of drones and uh, come in the conclusion to the uh, so-called Haiji uh, series of gliders. And Haiji um, is a uh, sea wing, um, translates to, to sea wing in English, and is like the, the most recent model or series of uh, underwater gliders. And they can perform surveys in, as they state, 99.8% of the global oceans and can carry... Um, different scientific payloads, which is really interesting um, for different um, mission um, requirements, right? Ninety nine point eight percent. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's really it's, amazing. It's it's not just amazing uh, as to what they can do. I also find it amazing to get a really comprehensive overview of what is out there and what is being used and what has been used in the past, because there are, there are so many different designs and uh, the way these things uh, operate. I guess that. Uh, it's, and yeah. it's really up to date. You, you've seen um, Polar Stern on on, uh, on the picture in, in, in the paper. So that's the Mosaic expedition, which they analyze here, the, yes. the drones that have been uh, deployed on that mission. So it's, it's very, very current. Um, it's, it's up to date. And it gives a very, very nice overview um, of scientific deployments of underwater drones. And it also... Um, reveals how important those drones are in, in answering um, a lot of um, huge scientific questions regarding the polar regions. To get a, a, a bigger picture of what's going on in the polar regions, you need those drones. And what they outline in that paper is actually um, the trends of polar um, underwater drones, where you have uh, plant observations in Antarctica, particularly under the Antarctic ice shelves. Just get the numbers, right? Almost 11% of the entire area of the Antarctic ice sheet is made of ice shelves. And they are largely unexplored. It's a big blank spot on the map. We just have glimpses of certain areas where um, um, an underwater camera has been deployed. But there has not been something like a large-scale 
uh, scientific research of the area under the ice shelves. We have a lot of basal melting on the ice shelves, warming ocean um, melting the ice shelf from underneath. We have thinning of ice shelf. We have no real idea how life under ice shelves looks like. Just remember a few months back when we reported on that picture that has been taken at the place where the iceberg broke off the ice shelf in, um, in the yep. Waddell Sea. And the I think the Alfred Wagner Institute was that publishing that picture just um, weren't completely amazed by how life um, has just thrived under the, uh, those very, very harsh conditions where we thought life is not possible. And those kind of uh, features are very, very important to um, to observe in the future or to, to deploy those drones to, to make those observations. Same goes, of course, for the, for the Arctic sea ice where you um, need long-range surveys underneath um, the Arctic sea ice to actually get a better picture, not only from above, but from a, a broad area from underneath. So we have... A, a big trend of more of those um, remote vehicles or remote drones. They have still some limitations that's also outlined in the paper, but they also say very, very clearly with um, small changes, you can actually extend the life uh, range of the um, underwater drone significantly. And that's very, very important for um, long-term observations. And it's really something um, I'm looking forward to if China, in the very near future, can actually deploy those underwater drones under the Antarctic um, ice shelves to get a better impact here. And it's it's not just a feat that they that they can make them and that they can be autonomously uh, doing stuff down there. Uh, the big problem would be to keep them energized, to keep the batteries exactly. charged and things, because you can particularly under the ice. Yeah, that's that's the thing. On a, on a Mars rover, you can put a, a few solar panels up, and uh, um, but under the ice, that won't help. So. That's interesting. It's also interesting to remember that we know a lot more about space, about what's out there, than we know yes. about our own oceans. So um, Certainly, yes. lots of research is required, and uh, these drones are are an important uh, way to go, especially as the pressures down there are so high that it takes a lot of effort to protect humans uh, going Indeed, to yeah. these depths and it's very dangerous. It's it's. I would venture the guess that it's more dangerous to be uh, at the at the bottom of some big trench down there than it is to be up in the ISS. And in some areas, for example, when you when you go to, towards the grounding line of ice shelves where the ice shelf is touching the ground, the right. sea floor, um, it's pretty much impossible to deploy uh, a submersible um, unless you have an right. uh, unmanned uh, drone, right, where you can go pretty close. So it's yeah. it's very interesting. I'm really looking forward for uh, the discoveries here on, uh, on on that behalf. That's that's certainly a topic that's um, coming up in the future episodes. Yeah, and last uh, but not least on our newsreel is um, something that's somewhere in the middle between the ocean and the <laughs> islands. Um, we're talking about ice and the preservation of our climate records, and that's trapped in the ice, as you rightly say. And how do we? Retrieve that we drill ice cores, and we talked about ice cores in previous episode. I think it it's was like it's like archaeology, right? The, the deeper you go, the earlier you look in our history, and the same is true with ice cores. Indeed, yeah, and it really depends on um, a number of factors: how fast is ice moving? How uh, often is it renewing? How often are, are new snow layers forming? Actually, new ice layers and so on. Um, but there are areas where you have a very, very good understanding of. Um, how climate looked like almost a million years back. And we have con uh, consistent ongoing or continuous ongoing um, ice cores dating back 800,000 years from Antarctica. And in this particular article here, we have a story from the, uh, from the Alps in, uh, in Europe where a scient uh, scientific research team uh, found an area where they had a very good understanding of um, what kind of information the ice core could contain. It took them two years to get the funding and the equipment um, together. And when they came back two years later, that glacier changed so significantly uh, where you have a thaw freeze uh, process where basically um, air pockets are created in the ice, filled then with um, frozen meltwater. It's unusable. The, the, the racket is just destroyed in that time period. And that's what we face right now, where scientists are running against the clock um, in terms of climate change where the thaw of 
the ice sheets of the of the ice core data just really destroys our climate record, our climate history. And that's something um, very important for our understanding. We try to find areas where we actually can drill deeper or where we get a um, higher resolution of the um, data we already have. And that's the second part of the same topic where we actually have um, some, some news from uh, Minnesota, from the uh, University of Minnesota, which actually... Um, got funding from the National Science uh, Foundation, uh, Foundation very recently. And the NSF is uh, financing um, the NSF Center for Oldest Ice Exploration called Coldex. And the University of Minnesota here will be in charge um, running that center and is actually trying to drill um, in Antarctica for an ice core that shall contain a continuous record of 1.5 million years of climate data continuous climate data and uh and but 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 that is i mean this is important but it's that's the climate at this location right so uh if we yes want and, um, yes and no okay so we have we have several factors that, that come um, into play here. And the climate on the location is always um, affected also by the entire world climate. So we True. see some some certain factors there. But um, the direction you're leading is very, very important because we need to, to um, retrieve ice cores from uh, a different um, number of locations to get a, a better, um, a, a more detailed picture of the world's climate. And that's particularly important for um, glaciers outside of the polar regions, like in the Alps, like in the uh, Himalaya, where the glaciers are shrinking on an um, unprecedented speed, and by that really destroy the possibility to retrieve those long-lasting um, data, right? Um, the, the ice cores that date back so much um, into Earth history are just lost. And that's uh, really um, causing scientists to run against the clock. And that's very, very uh, difficult at the time. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed there. Um, that concludes our Polar Newsreel. Uh, let's talk about space. That's what we're here for, space. The, the, the funny thing is that this topic actually It links in, is, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very nice segue to the main topic, exactly. Um, because a lot of, of these um, ice core drillings are actually conducted by NASA scientists. And when we hear the name NASA, most of us think or tend they, to think um, about space, right? They, they don't drill the, the ice cores from space with satellites with really long <laughs> appendages or something. I don't guess. No, they also have ground researchers um, being deployed into the polar regions um, doing the ice core drilling. Uh -huh. But when we think about NASA and we, we think about space, it's not entirely wrong. Because the intention when NASA was founded was um, entirely space-oriented. But that has changed tremendously. So NASA was established in 1958, and it was um, a result or a response to the launch of Sputnik, which happened a year earlier. So that opened the space race, if you remember. So the back then, the authority in the U.S., that was um, dealing with those kind of matters was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And NASA was the agency that actually replaced the so-called NACA. And NACA was just, yeah, just went into to NASA. So the, the idea, the focus was completely on space, on and aeronautics, of course. And I'm sure we all know very, very illustrious names like the Project Mercury or Project Gemini or the infamous uh, Apollo project, Apollo missions, um, where for the first time ever, mankind set foot on the moon. There were some tragedies in there, were a lot of success stories, but maybe not so many people remember names like Skylab, NASA's first and only independently built space station that was deployed in the late 60s and uh, lasted to the late 70s. But everyone remembers the space shuttle program, right? When I was a kid, this was kind of the closest you could get to Star Trek. It was kind of a real life version of Star Trek. And we have an amazing animation here in the video. So if you're just listening to the podcast, you might want to hop over to the YouTube to, to have a look at it. That's a channel and, by yeah, Jared, Jared Owen who put this together. Um, very, very impressive. Exactly. 
he covers a lot of different topics uh, in his channel, um, but I found this one animation about the space shuttle, the space shuttle system, the launch system, and how the space shuttle itself is um, just built and what it contains and how the missions are run. It's really, really amazing. For me as a child, that was really like something to to and, to look out for and so, and some of that glory is coming back now with uh, some privatization of space uh with SpaceX and other rocket companies that are beginning to uh, to fly missions tourists actually um SpaceX <laughs> has just uh as we record this there are four civilians up in space um up in a SpaceX vehicle and uh the, the, the tourism things, uh, the private research, a lot of things are moving up there. So that really links back a, to the space shuttle, which was kind of beginning these things, I guess. Indeed. And there's this kind of a very funny side note, because in um, polar expedition tourism, there is um, climate science, that play, uh, um, citizen science, that plays uh, a very important role in what we are doing, trying to uh, involve or engage our guests in um, scientific research or gathering data for researchers who have difficulties to go down or up to those very remote areas. And the privatization of space travel or space um, exploration might also lead to um, citizen science going into space at a point. That's a very interesting uh, outlook here. I, I think that's inevitable. But it will uh, sooner or later help uh, or happen. Indeed. But everything we, we looked at um, by now has been a human space flight. And NASA did not only focus on, on human space flight, but they sent a number of satellites, of probes, of rovers to outer space. And it's like these probes that deliver data that make scientists think if and how extraterrestrial life might develop and be sustained, right? That's a, one of the core questions NASA is uh, looking at. And in the 80s, under the... Um, the Reagan and uh, later the, uh, the Bush administration, NASA um, established the so-called Earth Science Earth Science Research Program that was created. And throughout the years, the research of that program has greatly participated in creating our current understanding of how our planet works. So basically, a lot of data, a lot of um, of animations, a lot of visualizations have come from NASA. So particularly, NASA, uh, NASA's climate research has contributed tremendously to uh, analyze and identify the human factor of anthropogenic climate change. And that's kind of very interesting if you see how certain administrations have responded to that, how they tried to, um, to use climate change as a vehicle pro or con or what direction uh, howsoever but uh, a federal run agency the space administration here is one of the key drivers in global climate change uh, climate change research and that's for me uh, always a, a very um, fascinating outlook if you like right and look a little bit closer um at NASA, it operates numerous research facilities, and the most famous probably are um, places like the Kennedy Space Center or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and certainly the Goddard Space Flight Center. We named that uh, a number of times in the podcast, and um, particularly the, the Goddard Space Flight Center is with approximately 10,000 civil servants and contractors, um, the largest combined organization of scientists and engineers in the United States. And they are dedicated to increasing knowledge of the Earth, the solar system, and the universe um, via observations from space. And here is where the link of Earth and space are getting together, right? So we have actually um, the very close connection of observing Earth from space to get a better understanding of how things work and project that into other places. And it was an observation from space that actually confirmed a theory that has been suggested by um, a Russian geographer in the 1960s. We talked about that in episode um, 88. And that was a lake, a large lake buried under tons of ice. He flew with a plane over Antarctica and thought that shape down there that looks like 
there's a lake underneath. It looks you, like a frozen lake. You are, you are, um, you are not really giving us the right scale when you say under tons of ice, because um, that thing is deep down there. It's very deep down. It's 3.7 kilometers or 2.4 miles yes. under the Eastern Arctic ice sheet. That's humongous. So this lake has covered with ice for millennia, cut off from literally every light contact with atmosphere for hundreds of thousands of years. That makes Lake Vostok a very terrific and truly unique resource terrestrial life. Here the scientists, they, they can go and learn and understand how life can evolve and sustain itself under conditions that for a long time in human history was considered to be not sustainable for life. So we thought life is not possible under those conditions. The drilling into Lake Vostok just exposed something completely different. Lake Vostok harbors a tremendously unique ecosystem and that's largely based on chemicals in rocks instead of sunlight. That's super interesting. Living in isolation for hundreds of thousands of years, the types of organisms that the scientists found suggested that they derived their energy from minerals present in the lake itself and sources from the underlying bedrock. So that's actually dissolving rocks to sustain life. Um, question. Uh, lake Vostok is three and a half uh, kilometers deep and uh, and thus it was cut cut off it's like probably it was a bit like the surface of a different planet the humans haven't been there um, certainly yeah so they are they have drilled into it um do you know if they made sure to not contaminate it with anything that we bring from from the surface yes and no so back in the days when the first um hole was drilled into like Vostok there was not so much thought um, spent on uh, contamination that right. happened later. But um, if you if you know how ice cores are drilled, then parts of the ice itself will be contaminated because you have to keep the um, the bore hat, uh, the drilling hat, um, liquid. You need to keep it moving, yeah. and they use usually kind of a fuel to to um, to isolate the um, core from the remaining ice. Otherwise, it would just freeze together very, very quickly, again, um, given the temperatures. So there's, and there's, that a, there's a, like an antifreeze kind of thing they exactly. use there. Okay. And on the very first borehole, it's um, thought that a, a small amount, but some sort of amount, ha might have contaminated a mm -hmm. certain area of that lake. And that, of course, is something that changes the ecosystem. You have a human impact um, on something that hasn't seen mankind ever in all its lifetime. So, yeah, there there is certainly an impact. Just curious. But it's interesting to see that the life in Lake Mostock doesn't just exist, it really thrives. We have more than 3,500 different species that has been identified, including a group that has been completely unknown before so it's a completely new group of um, organisms that have been cataloged here and it's this kind of of um, discoveries that nasa uses to simulate life on other extraterrestrial ob uh, objects and here we go to a place that looks very very similar and that's the moon europa which is orbiting jupiter as one of its uh, 79 moons it's the sixth closest uh, closest to uh, jupiter it's slightly smaller than um, our Earth's moon, but Europa is primarily made of uh, silicate rock and has a water ice crust. And here it's, it gets really, really interesting. For our understanding of life, water plays an essential role. Looking at the surface of, uh, of moon Europa, you can see, and that's something we have um, in the video podcast here, actually, we have a very nice picture of the surface of Europa. You can see... Um, that the surface is striated by cracks and streaks, but there's literally no crater visible, which is highly unusual for extraterrestrial ob objects. So Europa has the smoothest surface of any known solid objects in the solar system. Super interesting. And it, it's the smoothness of the surface that has led to the hypothesis that a water ocean exists beneath the surface. 
So we, we, we talk about the idea of that the surface of Europa is frozen and underneath a liquid water ocean exists. And given our understanding of life, this water ocean could conceivably harbor extraterrestrial life. So now we're connecting the dots of the research done in Antarctica on Lake Vostok and the research of extraterrestrial life on objects like the moon Europa. It's an extremely expensive um, research to um, deploy a mission to Europa to um, create the basic understanding of the conditions there to figure out how things are done. So luckily, NASA found some stand-in, if you like. And film production, we say stand-in that just comes in when um, the star actor is um, having a break. So um, Antarctica works a little bit in that way. So... The conditions in Antarctica, particularly at Lake Vostok, are very close to what to expect on uh, Europa. And drilling through such a thick layer of ice, and I just try to just recall that, uh, 3.7 kilometers, 2.4 miles of ice on top of a liquid lake. So the Lake Vostok is completely liquid underneath. That gives a very good idea what to expect on challenges to actually drill through the frozen surface of Europa and get to the liquid part. So here we have really um, a very good stand-in to understand how an operation on Europa might look like. So that's a, a very interesting um, side way to reach the answer of how life could have developed and may sustain itself on Europa. So there might be life forms. And that's like the big um, the big question mark here is, do we find um, life outside of Earth, somewhere so, in the solar system? And Europa is like the number one candidate here. Yeah, that's that's what I would have read in some places, that uh, liquid water means very good uh, chances for life. And, uh, exactly. That's also when when you when you go to Mars, um, it's the the big question of um, are there water storages somewhere in in some form? Can that maintain life? Can yep. is that yeah? Where, where you find water, you find proof of life. That's the the equation that's made up. But it's not only that, and it certainly is a very extraordinary topic. And I would love to just cover that in another separate episode because like Vostok itself really deserves um, a full spot on episode and um we plan to have um some some uh, very important guests on the show to actually talk about the research of lake vostok and the findings of life in lake vostok so that's coming up um in the future but this connects the mission of the u.s space agency to earth and um the undertaking of the space agency of broadening our understanding of space. So here we have really both things coming together. So it's primarily the aim to understand the system that favors and creates life on Earth in the first place. So we are in a in a very favorable condition, which we actually change tremendously and very, very quickly um, through the way we use, we facilitate Earth. But it's exactly that understanding of the system that um, needs to be understood to get a better idea of how life on other planets could have formed or might still exist. And that leads to the fact that today NASA and its um, many research facilities are one of the key drivers in um, Earth sciences, but also climate research. And it has amazing programs brought um, to daylight, like Operation Icebridge as part of the Airborne uh, science program. Operation Air Bri- uh, Ice Bridge just went over both big ice sheets, over Greenland and over Antarctica. And it has flown uh, numerous missions and has created high resolution pictures of a number of places. I think there is no place better cartographer uh, than um, Antarctica at the, play- at the moment through satellites, through um, aerial photography from Ice Bridge, radar. Um, measurements from Icebridge. 10 years of operation has gathered so much information on that. It's really outstanding. Reading from participants of that mission how 
monotonous, how boring that mission was at times. So if you think about um, flying from the west to the east coast of um, Greenland, for example, you see for hours nothing else but <laughs> white, yes. a plain, flat, white area. It's everything but exciting for scientists. That but takes the endurance. Outcome that takes a lot been. of endurance. <laughs> it, it does. The outcome is super important because we have an understanding now how the ice sheets are forming, where they are actually growing, and where they are losing on a tremendous speed um, on the periphery. And that's one of many programs. Um, the Climate Change Research Initiative, Aquarius, the first orbiting instrument to map sea surface salt concentrations worldwide, the Geostationary Carbon Observatory, GeoCarb, the Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite, um, ISAT2, the Landsat program of satellites 7, 8, and 9, they're delivering groundbreaking imagery of the Earth, of the human interaction with environment. You can really see the impact of mankind on the planet with these pictures. It's outstanding. Or the Sentinel program that for the very first time in human history gave an evidence to local observations of retreating and particular deflating glaciers and ice caps. So the Sentinel program was initiated um, after a mission to Greenland, where scientists said it feels like we are lower than we've been last year. And the Sentinel satellites are actually circulating. It's two satellites following each other, and they're circulating the Earth on the same orbit over and over and over again, and they're taking the same measurements. It's not high-resolution pictures. They're actually just taking um, uh, altitude points. And by that, give us an understanding of um, how the um, elevation of the ice has changed, where we actually see um, the biggest deflation, where we actually see an increase, which is very, very few parts on the planet. But the Sentinel program has developed a lot over the years and has deployed more and more satellites. And now we actually get also very nice footage and we have a website and we put it into the show notes where you actually can browse this those pictures. This is amazing. This is all publicly available? It is. That is a treasure trove of information. Wow. It is. And, and we're getting further. NASA sends scientists to both poles to, to drill for ice cores, uh, ice cores, to trace back the changes of our atmospheres and to understand what drives our change at the moment, what the tipping points might look like, and many, many things more. The study of Earth as an integrated system to form the most current picture of our planet um, that is like the core pillar of NASA's programs. Everything is based on the understanding of our planet. And this deep involvement of NASA scientists and researchers has really created a tremendous fundus of, of information. And with that research, NASA is highly contributing not only to the research end, but also leading and communicating its work. And that's right. what I would like to finish today's um, episode with, is really an overview about um, what they offer there. NASA created groundbreaking science communication platforms. And that's really something other institutes um, can look up to. It's not only translating scientific research to non-academic, it also fosters through these platforms a stewardship for our planet and not only the polar regions. Just take the scientific visualization studio. We use that really tremendously. We've talked On about this science, before here, yeah. Yes, yes. It's part of the Goddard Space Flight Center. So the website of the Scientific uh, Visualization Studio um, offers you numerous vi visualizations of both the space but also Earth. It helps us to understand and lets the complexity of scientific research look not only nice but also super easy to comprehend. So for me personally, this website is a well, well visited database of terrific imagery. And whenever I prepare a lecture, I hold on board my expedition cruises, I consult um, this website to, to get imagery. And as a professional photographer, I can attest to the importance of visuals. Pictures really say more than a thousand words. So showing things in, in a visualization, in visualizations of this quality, and we're not talking about photos only. We're talking about video. We're talking about motion. Um, this is amazing. So I could spend days and days just browsing there and uh, looking at at their 
at their stuff. It's a, it's a really amazing and resource. The most amazing fact on, on this database is that NASA offers that on a Creative Commons license. Yes. So you easily can uh, use those papers for educative purposes. For it's any purpose, really, pretty much. For, for right? any purpose, yeah. pretty much, yes. So for me, that's really a huge, huge advantage. And the Visualization Studio even goes further and has um, published not long ago the uh, NASA Visualization Explorer app. So that gets the entire experience into your pocket onto your smartphone. Uh, smartphone. I highly recommend to have a look at it. And of course, we will put it um, into the show notes. But let's hop on to the next one. We have the Earth Observing System, EOS which is another pool. Here you have access to processed images from all the different NASA missions with focus on many different aspects of the Earth system. Each and every mission has a different uh, purpose, so you get different outcomes here. Here you can access the Earth Observer, which is like a, a frequent um, uh, published paper, and that reports for over 30 years on the research done through NASA's Air Science Program. It's very interesting. It's available for free. It's a bi-week uh, and a bi-monthly um, publication at the moment. Um, certainly a recommendation to have a look at it. You can uh, subscribe to the newsletter. It's really um, well organized. It's available online. It's available as a PDF. You can even um, subscribe to it as a, a physical print copy. It's really um, a great source for additional information. Very nicely translated again. And another one is very similar, the Earth Observatory. But the Earth, Ob Earth Observatory really focus on this breathtaking image, uh, images and articles. So that's really more a very uh, popular-oriented um, communication spot. They always put a spot um, on very recent topics. They try to deliver footage to highlight very certain aspects are, um, of things that happen right now. So take the most recent fire series all over the world, the wildfires, um, tremendous size, right? And they actually took the example of the wildfires in the United States and the researchers delivered background information how climate change is not only making wildfires more frequent but push them to higher grounds into higher altitudes where they have not been presented before. So visual, uh, visualizing that but also explaining background information linking to further sources is really an amazing um, database here as well. For many journalists and media outlets, this is really a great hub to gather ideas um, or media to support their um, own projects. Really, really something amazing. And last but not least, we highlighted it in a lot of episodes throughout the pod podcast, particularly in our video version when we talked about Iceberg A68A, and that's NASA Worldview which is a, a pretty amazing website. Um, Worldview is so much fun and joy to explore. It's almost real-time satellite imagery. Remember when we talked about Iceberg A68A, the footage was, I think it was just the previous day, which was <laughs> exactly. in there. So for, for us, that's really like the thing um, to uh, to go, right? It's, it's really something very, very um, interesting to see to follow up on those developments, really, really mind-blowing to me. So much of the work is done in the polar regions, and particularly for us um, polar nerds, this really is a gift to have, um, having all those sources, all the research, um, to actually make us understand how precious these places are, but also what impact they have to our daily lives thousands of miles away. So for me... Um, connecting space and earth will always be a recurring topic because that's really amazing amazing that's the that's the right uh the right uh, word to close this off wow what a collection of interesting stuff we have here um we've lost you uh, especially your <laughs> your picture right now we can still hear you though so everything is fine um and uh with that i guess we are 
gonna be uh, closing off this episode. Um, we'll be back soon with another one. And uh, Henry, we cannot see you, but um, say but bye bye here. to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening thanks for watching uh, see you soon bye and of course you can find us online at Curiously Polar on our uh, website curiouslypolar.com on the social media and uh, on YouTube on our channel which is also called Curiously Polar until then take care bye bye